Hi everyone, it's Raina. So I'm going to do a very brief reading on the natal chart of Nick Drake. The reason it's going to be very brief is because I really don't know a lot about his life. I think in the 90s, my partner um, was given a tape by one of his buddies who had, it was like a mixtape. And Nick Drake was one of the people on those tapes. And I remember listening back then. Now, this was before, you know, this was probably like 10 years before YouTube ever existed. So it wasn't like um, I had that alternative. So it was like, wow, who's this person? Because, you know, when you're just relying on the radio to get turned on to different um, uh, artists, musical artists, it makes it a lot harder to get exposed to new, um, people. <laughs> and of course, well, Nick Drake wouldn't have been new then because he passed away in the seventies at the age of 26. So, you know, I think it was like 1974. So anyway, um, he was one of those people that I, I think we would say he became more well known when a car company used the song Pink Moon in one of the commercials. And I think that was around the mid nineties, but I'm not quite sure. But anyway, he was someone who you would characterize as a folk singer. And I think he was mainly active from 1969 to 1972. He made at least three studio albums that I'm familiar with. And he never, I don't think he ever performed live, or if he did, he was never recorded. So there's no video of him doing a live performance. He is really that mysterious. And um, he was one of those uh, enigmatic figures who never achieved fame in his lifetime. And if you listen to the song of his called Fruit Tree, you will see that it probably bothered him. And I know that Elton John um, did a cover version of one of his songs because when Nick Drake began, Elton John also was uh, trying to break into the music business in the late 60s. And it was a thing at that time to do covers of, you know, various artists, hoping that, you know, if the artists themselves didn't hit it big, then maybe their song would hit it big with somebody else. And Elton had already recorded his first album, if I'm not mistaken, called Empty Sky, which was released in 1969. But it really, I mean, it was shelved in America and was not released into the until the mid seventies. So he had not broken through yet, but he went back and he continued to do these covers because that was kind of a way for him to make a quick buck, you know? And he said later on that it was, it was kind of like amusing to do these covers because they would kind of try to emulate certain artists. And because they did that, um, Elton really didn't um, have his own sound, I would say, nailed down at that point. But I don't think that his cover of Nick Drake really worked because Nick Drake um, had a very, what I would call, melancholy tone to his voice that Elton John... Um, he could be very soulful and touching, but not in that particular way. So I definitely recommend if you haven't listened to Nick Drake to do so. He has a timeless quality. In other words, there's something about his songs that do not seem like they belong in that era of the late 60s or early 70s. And perhaps that's why he really was ahead of his time and didn't uh, hit it big while he was um, uh, on this planet. 
And he died at the age of 26 from an antidepressant overdose, and it is unclear whether or not it was an accident. Um, but listen to the song Fruit Tree, and you'll see that this obscurity that he lived with during his lifetime, that it was something that was probably uh, really um, bothering him because, you know, you had these other people that were his contemporaries, like I just said about Elton John, who then became, you know, mega famous within a few years, and he remained toiling away in obscurity. And the last two years of his life, he didn't even record. But um, in any case, I wanted to basically, without knowing a lot about his life, to just see like what could be maybe the cause of his, you know, finding himself in that kind of place where he was not well-known during his lifetime. And when I say well-known, you don't even have to be like this major celebrity, but even having even a cult following, he did not have that in his lifetime. And probably now you would say that he's got a cult following because I don't think that, um, although he does have uh, millions of hits of some of his songs. So maybe it's a lot more uh, mainstream than I think. Like even doing this particular video, I was thinking to myself, I don't even know how many people know who he is. So um, Nick Drake was a later degree Gemini individual. And when I plugged his info into um, my chart generator and um, saw the chart itself, I kind of burst out laughing because he had f four um, planets in his 12th house. And I totally was expecting to see that there because, you know, that's Pisces domain. And it would indicate somebody who was very reclusive and because they have no footage of any of his performances, I certainly think that that uh, was part of his situation, that he didn't have an extroverted nature. He probably was uh, painfully shy. If, if anyone knows uh, more information about his demeanor. I mean, I'm just going by even looking at pictures of him. He seemed very, very shy. And usually if someone is trying to make a name from, for themselves in show business, they will, you know, be like in all these places and they'll tour and they'll try to do this and that. And I don't know that he really um, put himself out there. But he did get, um, you know, these, he did get like a, a record label contract. So they, he definitely was seen as somebody who was talented or he wouldn't have gotten a contract in the first place. But there's also the issue of being able to kind of market somebody like that. And this is something that happened to Laura Nero as well. I think if she would n not have had those uh, hits that were covered by other artists, that she would have possibly met with the same fate of Nick Drake professionally, where, you know, she was perhaps really um, well-respected by her peers, but not necessarily commercially successful. So um, anyway... Nick had his son, Mercury, Venus, and Uranus in that 12th house. So three out of the four planets were personal planets. His son was in Gemini. His moon was in Scorpio. He had Mercury in Cancer, Venus in Cancer, Mars in Virgo, and Cancer rising. And Cancer is a hypersensitive sign. Because it's a water sign, it's very um, subjective very personalized. 
Same with the moon in Scorpio. And he had an exact uh, in conjunction between his sun and his moon signs. And how that could have played out is that he, you know, when you have a, a combination of an air sign, sun sign, and a, and a water sign, moon sign, it can be, it can feel very discombobulating because you want to be detached and yet you're not, and especially with Scorpio. So it's, um, it can be quite the dilemma there of how do you navigate these very um, difficult emotions and maintain that objectivity that Gemini loves to do. And he just had so much water. And then he had these personal plants in a water house, the 12th house. Now, from what I understand, from what I have read, that if you have planets in the 12th house, and of course, like I said, he had three out of four were personal planets, that you have unfinished karmic business. Of course, we could say that all of us have unfinished karmic business uh, to one degree or another, just by virtue of being on this planet. But maybe it's heightened when you have all these plants in the 12th house. So whether it's some kind of karmic contract where the person has this talent and they have this, uh, I was going to say compulsion, but they, they feel compelled to, you know, produce creatively that they would experience uh, a lack of, maybe they uh, intentionally chose to, to experience a lack of commercial success or even acknowledgement um, from the public because they were meant to do something for the sake of doing it. It's kind of like when you love someone. If you need that kind of validation from another person, then sometimes people are, you know, giving to get. They're giving love to get love. And that can end up with a situation where the person's chasing love and they're not necessarily getting it because they have an agenda. They're, they're, um, they have an empty you know, they are an empty vessel and they're looking to be filled up from another person. Um, a few more observations that I don't have any um, firsthand, not, well, firsthand knowledge. I don't have any knowledge of based on reading a biography or whatnot. But um, Nick had Pluto in the first house, so sometimes this might be some kind of trauma that he had to endure coming into this world. Um, sometimes, and I don't want to put this on a parent um, necessarily, but whoever it could have been in his life, sometimes this could be a tyrannical adult who is very um, much a part of his life. And if somebody is very shy and very sensitive, this will affect them that much more. Also, Nick had a conjunction between the moon and um, Chiron. So that is extremely sensitive. Um, painfully, his emotions are just like, completely sensitive. Sometimes this can be this connection with the mother. The mother is um, this source of that sensitivity. Maybe she has that in her own life and he feels it through her. Uh, now his moon is in Scorpio, so I don't know if he had an overbearing mother uh, or like a smothering type of a mother. I can't say. He does have a lot of cancer energy here. His cancer rising 
um, means that he was ruled by the moon, which can mean that kind of um, shifting of emotions. And of course, maybe that even means mood swings. Um, in his third house, he had Neptune here, and that could have been, you know, th this is the house of the mind. So it certainly indicates a mind that is very creative, not necessarily practical, but definitely creative. He had a square between uh, Mercury and Neptune, which means um, the person who may have even a learning disability or some kind of issue with um, the way that the person processes information. They may not hear things as they are being said. So there's a distortion somehow. And um, because of that, that can lead to not really being able to, you know, absorb reality as it is unfolding before him. There's definitely a lot of this kind of Piscean, Neptunian influence in his chart, and that can be very good for artistic endeavors or spiritual endeavors, but not so much for day-to-day -day living. And I mean, I would even say things like schizophrenic tendencies with those 12th house placements. Um, you know, you could say mental illness, but... That's kind of a broad thing. I mean, um, there, there are, uh, that's on a spectrum. But, you know, being out of touch with the reality can be a real thing. And we also have to remember, because I personally believe that individuals who are disassociative or schizophrenic um, are actually very... Um, you know, much in connection with other dimensions and they just don't have control over it. So it becomes rather um, chaotic, you could say, where it's just kind of like coming out uncontrolled. So that can add to disorientation in the person's basic you know, day-to-day -day life. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, mention a few things about his chart. Also, Chiron in the fifth house can be unrequited love. And I was listening to one of his songs, and it did seem like that was the case. And I might have even, even seen a comment about some Maybe it was some girl that he fell in love with uh, that may not have loved him back or it just didn't go anywhere. Maybe he was, he probably was too shy to even make a move. So maybe he loved from afar. Um, so, you know, you can see these things in a person's chart and it can give a little bit of a window into the world that um, they were in. Now, I w one last thing I want to say is that his north node was in the 10th house of career and public reputation. And it was in Taurus, which is, you know, ruled by Venus. And we could say that that is one of the signs that could be connected to the arts. So, you know, his destiny was to be before the public, but his son... <laughs> Uh, Mercury and Venus and Uranus, but these personal planets in particular were in the 12th house. So he probably had this tendency to be a loner, maybe even this desire to kind of like keep to himself. And that kind of makes it very hard to be, you know, in front of an audience. Maybe he had stage frights even. Um, but he obviously wanted to 
share his talent with the world. So, um, you know, he doesn't have any planets in the fourth or the eighth houses. And both of these houses um, can be connected to the nature of somebody's death. So I don't know what to say about that in particular, but he does have in his eighth house, he has part of Pisces, which could indicate some kind of confusion, um, as well as the ruler, you know, of, of Pisces is Neptune. That can be kind of like, um, drugs. So like a death from drugs. And, um, in the fourth house, part of his fourth house has Scorpio, and that can be something that is secretive or otherwise, um, not like, like a mystery. So I don't know if that's a bit of a stretch, but yeah, I mean, he is a very compelling figure, not only because his songs are so interesting. There's a dreamy quality to his music, as well as a melancholy one, of course. But um, also because of the fact that he is such a mystery because we don't have anything to go on with him, you know, performing... Uh, publicly and that sort of thing. I was thinking of Sid Barrett, who was an original member of, of Pink Floyd when they were called the Pink Floyd. And, you know, there's that kind of, I mean, uh, Sid Barrett was also British like Nick Drake and he went mad. And because of that, he left the band and, but he has an indelible part of the Pink Floyd um, legend, and he is on the record the early recordings, and his influence I think you can't deny. Um, when you talk about it's kind of like that. I don't know if you would call it like progressive rock psychedelia, psychedelia, and. Uh, Anyway, um, that's another band that has a timeless quality that, you know, is adored by the public. And um, so just wanted to make a quick video about this, 23-minute <laughs> quick video. Uh, thanks for listening. Take care. Bye.